Good morning. We want to welcome all of you this morning to Living Waters Chapel. Those of you watching online, those of you here in person, you crack me up every time because when that countdown gets to like three seconds, everybody sits up 
upright on their best behavior. I hope you, those of you watching online, sit up on your couch and, and just stop and listen for the authority that's up here on stage. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but we're glad you're here this morning. We are not here to worship the authority on this stage, but to worship the authority of heaven. Amen. Amen. The one who is the everlasting God. So we invite you to stand with us, to worship with us. Those of you watching online, wherever you are, if you're driving, don't try to stand up. Uh, just worship right where you are this morning. We want to sing the everlasting God. Let's put our hands together this morning. Sing it out with us now. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign time. You are the everlasting. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You do not faint. You won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You come You're so good to us. You're so, so good. Thank you for who you are. 
Well, as we sing this next song, just allow the words to remind you of the goodness of our God. Just sing it along with King. I love, I love you, you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. For all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay in my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness. Sing it together all my life. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, for oh, I will sing of the goodness.
to play through that chorus, just begin to sing of the goodness of God, to tell of the goodness of God. Without words on a screen, without me leading, just let your heart take over and just continue to worship him for his goodness. God, you're so That's going on, he's above, he's above it all, he's above it all, and he's so good to me, and I love him so, yes I love him so to a personal say I love you so and I love you so every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after me. Your goodness is chasing after me. Even when I have walked away, even when I have failed you, Lord, you're running after me. You're the everlasting God from everlasting to everlasting. You are faithful. You are good. You are just. And God, you are chasing after your people. Like the father with the prodigal son, you never give up on us. You're so good to me. Yes, you're so good to me. Just that last line. Yes, you're so good to me. Oh, one more time. You're so good. You're so God, you're so good. You're so faithful. What an everlasting love you have loved us with. A reckless love. A love that chases us down, that fights till we're found. Thank you for your love, Lord. Listen, before I spoke, before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. Oh, he's been so good to us, amen. You have been so, so good to me. Yes, he has. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. You have been so, so kind to me. Come on, sing it together now. Still you give your 
was your foe, and I was your foe, still your love fall for me. You have been so, so good to me. Oh, I love this part when I fell nowhere. together to fellowship as one body and one unit God and I just thank you that your goodness is always with us no matter what we're going through no matter the situation that your love and your goodness is the same today tomorrow and forever and God I just thank you for Pastor Rich God and I just pray that you would just bless the words that he is saying that you would open the hearts 
of everyone in here, God, and that you would just, that your Holy Spirit would just come down and renew people in a new and unseen way in their lives. God, I just thank you that we have an ability to meet together and we have an ability to come together and worship together as some don't. And I just pray over those people that do not, God, and I just thank you for the people online that are watching, that you would just bless them in their home and that you would just bless them in their situation that they are going through, that your love would just be evident in everybody's lives, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What a marvelous, amazing, reckless love our God has for us. He chases after us, follows us. He doesn't let us go, doesn't let us fall out of his hand. Amen. You know, some of you are still standing, and we invite you to remain standing and greet one another. If you're not comfortable, though, with people coming into your space, we ask that you just remain seated, and people will kind of wave from a distance. Those of you here in person, begin to greet one another. Those of you watching online, once again, we want to say welcome to you. We're glad that you're joining us this morning. We'd love to hear from you in the comments. Just begin to welcome each other here in person and in line. Well, good morning. Once again, we want to welcome those of you that are here in person with us. Pastor Dalton, they sat down a lot quicker than last week. I watched online last week, and poor Pastor Dalton was standing here for a while, and then Ben repeated playing the song again, and then Ben repeated the playing the song again, but that's part of being family of God, amen? Welcoming one another. And so we're glad that you're here. If it's your first time, or your first time in a while, we direct you to those cards in front of you on the chairs. There's a, a welcome card there, a guest card. We'd like to get to know you. Also, one of the things that we like to do to show that we are a family here at Living Waters Chapel is to sing happy birthday once a month to all of our family members, our church family members here. So if you have a birthday in October, would you please stand up so we can sing happy birthday to you. I see there's one way back there in the back. She stood up as tall as she can. Yep. And uh, Dad, why don't you hold her up so everybody can see that it's her birthday? You can give her a birthday parade. Yeah. And uh, I, I know this gentleman back here. I'm not going to mention your name and throw you under the bus, but you had multiple birthday dinners yesterday from what I saw uh, on Facebook. I was a little jealous. Did you know that our birthdays are so close to each other? We should go together next time. It is my birthday this month as well, two Sundays ago on 10-4. So let's sing happy birthday. When we get to that part, instead of singing their name, just sing God loves you. Ready? Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God loves you. Happy birthday to you. I know there's a couple other people that are not in here this morning, like uh, Alyssa Light, who was up here singing on stage and prayed for us uh, at the end of worship. Make sure you say happy birthday to her as well. Pastor Chris, would you come and share some announcements? 
You may wonder why I don't lead happy birthday. If I let it one time, you would understand why I don't lead happy birthday. That's all I'm going to say. But we want to welcome you to Living Waters Chapel, whether you're here in person or online. We just thank you for worshiping with us. I want to direct your attention to a few announcements. Uh, please pick up your announcement bulletin. Uh, if you notice, they did move. They did move. Uh, they are on the side walls, uh, along with the uh, prayer bulletins, the sermon notes, as well as some additional uh, giving boxes. So uh, we won't be uh, having the buckets in the back, but there's uh, giving boxes on either wall, and, it's, and there's a box at the back of the sound booth as well. So tomorrow evening is our Mothers of Preschoolers event that will be happening over in the uh, Fellowship Building as well as they are taking orders for pumpkin rolls. So if you don't want to bake a pumpkin roll and you would like to help support Mops, you can place an order for a pumpkin roll, and uh, that would be a, a wonderful, wonderful blessing. I will not spend too much time thinking about a pumpkin roll, but the more I talk about it, the more I think about it. So let's go on to the next uh, reminder. Northside cleanup will be taking place on Saturday, October 24th. We will be meeting at the mini park. Uh, you can sign up out in the foyer or online. We will be having a new uh, grow group that will meet on Wednesday evenings, and we are calling this The Ascent. And this is uh, going to take place uh, two Wednesdays in October, two Wednesdays in November. And this uh, particular grow group will be for individuals who are new believers, uh, new to Living Waters Chapel, or have a desire uh, to become a covenant partner. We're asking that you would uh, please sign up if you are interested in being part of this grow group. The, there are cards out in the, in the lobby as well as you can sign up online, and it has all the information that you need to know, and we'll be learning about connecting with God, our church, and the world, growing in Christ, our church, and in the world, serving God, serving our church, serving the world, and then what it means to be a covenant partner. Uh, we want to remind you of our giving options. You can certainly give online. You can give through uh, your mobile phone. You can continue to send in uh, your tithes and offerings through the mail, and then as well as the giving boxes that are located uh, in the back of the uh, sanctuary on your way out of the sanctuary. We want to thank you uh, for your gifts and your cards and your kind words. Uh, the pastoral staff would like to thank you for uh, honoring us during pastor appreciation, and we just want to uh, just once again say thank you for for those uh, blessings and those uh, kind words. At this time, I'm going to invite Pastor Rich to make his way up here to the podium. He is going to be sharing with us, and I just wanted to uh, just offer prayer for him uh, before he shares. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that you have laid on Pastor Rich's heart. I ask God that you would open up our hearts, our minds to be attentive to what you want to say to us. I ask God that you would just bless him, give him a special anointing to communicate your words to us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Chris. It's always a pleasure to share God's word and a real privilege, and so I look forward to this opportunity this morning. And uh, we are going to continue our uh, sermon series on spiritual maturity. Uh, our topic this morning, the title of my message is The Perseverance of God. And when you look at that title, you might wonder, well, what does that have to do about our spiritual maturity? It sounds more like uh, it has something to do with God's maturity. Uh, but uh, the reality is uh, we're going to look at the, the character of Jacob in the Old Testament. And uh, as I go through this this morning, uh, I'm going to talk about Jacob, what we can observe and learn from him. Um, I think that all of us, in one way or another, have some aspects and elements of Jacob uh, his, his character defaults and defects in our lives. Uh, and I hope that I can share this in such a way that it contrasts and emphasizes God's compassionate, persistent love and his persevering grace for all of us, even as he was persistent and persevered with Jacob. 
Well, the 15th century theologian and reformer John Calvin developed the, the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, which is a part of his extensive writings titled Institutes of the Christian Religion. There would be no perseverance of the saints were it not for the more profound and mysterious perseverance of God with mankind throughout the whole of history. This, in essence, is the storyline of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, God seeking and pursuing a relationship with Adam's race. Following an Adam and Eve's act of disobedience and rebellion against God, we read these initial responses of God to that rebellion, their sin. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, and he asked a simple question, Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Where are we today in regards to God's relentless pursuit of us to have a relationship with us and to reveal himself and his greatness to us? The Apostle John uh, was inspired and had a vision into the throne room of heaven as he was on the Isle of Patmos. And in the book of Revelation, we read that there were four living creatures and he saw 24 elders bowing down before the very a throne of Christ, the victorious Lamb of God, and they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men, that is humanity, men and women, people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. God's pursuit is accomplished through his son, Jesus Christ, as we read it in Revelation. Well, throughout history, God is the great pursuer of people. Though totally self-sufficient and self-existent, God looks for those who are willing to partner with him to unveil his incredible plan of redemption and to participate and to make it known to those who have not heard. An observant student of the Old Testament would notice that God's unrelenting perseverance and patience with Israel uh, is, is seemingly uh, almost futile, one generation after another. Uh, someone uh, may be faithful, a remnant, a few may get it, but generation after generation, they seem to turn aside, turn after other gods, uh, and are unfaithful to the Lord Jehovah. They falter to accomplish his mission of being a people who will take the light of God to the nations. Our Heavenly Father's perseverance is more intimately personified through his Son, Jesus Christ, as we get to the Gospels in the New Testament. Jesus exerted great patience and perseverance with the disciples. He was pinning all of his hopes on them for the future of the church. He never gave up on them, even though they misunderstood who he was. They were slow to get the point of his teaching, and eventually they abandoned him in his greatest hour of need. Like the disciples, we will see that Jacob failed to grasp what God wanted to do through him and to comprehend the patient persistence of God in getting Jacob to fully trust him. And that is really the essence and at the root of Jacob's struggle, his lifelong struggle to trust God. In Psalms uh, 43 and verse 7, we read this phrase, the God of Jacob. Uh, once you study the character of Jacob a little bit, that might seem like a peculiar phrase, somewhat paradoxical in that Jacob truly lived up to his name for the majority of his life. The meaning of his name, heel grabber, supplanter, deceiver, manipulator, conniver. He was always trying to get ahead and work things and situations to his advantage. If ever God pursued a diamond in the rough to work with, it was Jacob. Jacob stopped at nothing to get ahead of his elder brother, to gain his father's attention and approval, and to experience God's favor in his life, which, based on his character, he was far from worthy of. When we come to faith in Christ, we may refer to this in some way or another as finding God, you know, when someone finds God or finds Christ. 
as though God had been in hiding somewhere or he was lost to us. And the reality is, we were the ones who were lost. God was the one on the search to find us. What did it take for God to find you? How long has he pursued you? Are you still running from him today in one way or another? I ask you who are here in the sanctuary this morning and I ask those who are joining us by way of our online service to consider these questions. I came across this story of a gentleman, a British poet by the name of Francis Thomas, Thompson rather, Francis Thompson. Over a century ago, he had experienced the unrelenting love of God that eventually arrested his wandering sin-sick soul. He had uh, captures his personal experience of running from God for years uh, in his classic poem, The Hound of Heaven. And uh, I have this uh, in your bulletin insert for the benefit of those at home who don't have the bulletin insert. I'd like to read this poem as Thompson captures the reality of God's persistence and pursuit of him until he is saved. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the mist of tears, I hid from him and under running laughter. I visited slopes, I sped and shot precipitated adown titanic glooms of chasmed fear from those strong feet that followed, followed after. Thompson was hopelessly addicted to opium and was certain for death on the streets of London, but God put a loving Christian couple in his path who helped him not only with his felt need to get help for his addiction, but with his true need to find a lasting bona fide relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Their actions saved his life literally and spiritually as he surrendered the whole of his life to the hound of heaven. My prayer for us today is that we, no matter where we are in life, we may not be as desperate as Thompson was, but we all are desperately in need of God and trusting him. Well, Jacob, uh, his story is told in the book of Genesis, and of course Moses is attributed to be the recorder of the whole of the book of Genesis. Roughly the first half of this record of Genesis covers the creation account, the fall of man, primeval civilization before and after the great flood, and then the beginning of the nation of Israel through Abraham and his successor, the son of promise, Isaac. These two men are the original recipient and the first generation heir of the covenant promise of God to bless all nations of the world through their descendants, through their family. What a privilege and what a calling. While Abraham is most remembered for his faith and his obedience to God and his nobility toward his nephew Lot and helping him a time or two, yet he is flawed enough to have lied to two foreign kings to save his own life while jeopardizing his wife's safety and integrity. His son Isaac is flawed enough to repeat his father's same mistake years later, but only once. God seems to have raised the bar on the degree of unscrupulousness that he is willing to work with when we come to Genesis chapter 25 and are introduced to Jacob the grandson of Father Abraham and the next in line to represent the God of the covenant promises to his generation. J. Oswald Sanders makes this observation concerning God's selection and pursuit of Jacob. Had we been looking for a man, Sanders says, to head up a nation through which to achieve a high and holy purpose and in whom all the nations were to be blessed, Jacob would have been last of our choices. Esau, Esau the magnanimous, Esau the large-hearted would have been much higher on the list for us. 
Who else but God would have chosen a despicable character like Jacob? There is little that is attractive about this greedy, grasping, scheming man. So mean that he took advantage of his brother's extremity to flinch not only his earthly inheritance, but his spiritual authority. Well, we're going to eventually conclude uh, by the uh, end of my message in Genesis chapter 32. And you may want to turn there uh, to be ready, but I want to go back a few chapters more and actually find uh, um, uh, a, a little bit of a, a history and an overview, do a little bit of an overview of what led up to the wrestling match that Jacob endures with God in Genesis chapter 32. So we're going to go back to chapter 25, and I'm going to try to, with God's help, do a very quick survey of some of the events of the chapters leading up to chapter 32. Now, Jacob's struggle uh, begins as God's prophetic word comes to Rebekah as she is pregnant with, unbeknownst to her at the moment, twins, twin sons. God speaks to her of the tumult that is going on within her womb, and he says this to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Well, that's peculiar in a uh, patriarchal society and culture. Without today's technology and science, Rebecca has a divine ultrasound. And guess what? Surprise, you're having twin boys. And you can almost sense that there's going to be some opposition, some tension, some conflict between these brothers even before they're born. Well, uh, as the chapter unfolds, we see the birth of the boys. Esau was the firstborn. His body was, uh, it was noted that he was a hairy baby, okay? That's the meaning of the name, Esau. Now, again, I have nothing against any parent. It's your right to name your child whatever you want to ch name them. And no offense to anyone who is here today by the name of Esau or Jacob, uh, or if you know of anyone by that name. But could you imagine naming your baby Harry? Uh, he was apparently had red hair because uh, he was also referred to as Edom in some places, and so uh, red hairy, okay, or hairy red. Now, Jacob, as uh, Esau was born, Jacob's hand is proceeding out the birth canal and grasping the heel of his elder brother, who was first out, uh, of the first one born, grasping his heel. His name, obviously, Jacob, meaning heel grabber. There's dysfunction in this home, and I don't mean to psychoanalyze or be a psychiatrist for some family millenniums ago, but there's a few things we just have to observe. Uh, now, Esau was an outdoorsman. He loved to be, uh, he was a man's man. He liked to hunt. Uh, he liked, I'm sure he liked to fish. He just, he, he thrived for the outdoors. Jacob was a quiet, kind of a homebody, bound at home and uh, enjoyed cooking and, and being around uh, the camp. Uh, as, as it were, uh, for his people, and, uh, and that's fine. But the dysfunction comes in when we realize that uh, between the parents, Isaac and Rebekah, dad loved Esau and made no bones about it. This was not a secret. Mom loved Jacob. How many of us understand, okay, even you who are not parents, showing favoritism of one child over another is a recipe for conflict and disaster. This is not good. We've had three children uh, God has blessed us with, and we have tried to assure them over and again, if it ever came out in one way or another, or we sense that they felt we loved one over the other, we love you all the same, uh, we love you equally, God has blessed us with you, and we're thankful for you. You're all loved, okay? So uh, let's, let's try to make that, that, that clear. Well, this issue of the birthright, and this is some, somewhat interesting. You may not gather this from the text, but uh, Jacob and Esau are somewhere in their 70s. They've been around a while, and I think scholars kind of backdate things, knowing uh, how long Jacob lived and uh, the events of his life. They back it up uh, in, in the book of Genesis. He was not in his teens or 20s at this point, these, these boys. Uh, they are in their midlife, uh, somewhere in their 70s. And uh, 
this issue of the birthright comes about. One day Esau comes home and he's starving, he's hungry, his brother has been practicing his talents, his gifts in the, in the camp kitchen, cooking a, a wonderful stew. And uh, Esau comes in and says, give me some of that food. And Jacob says, huh, you can have some, but I want you to give me your birthright. Now, this, this was, a, again, a cultural privilege, something that was very important in the uh, Jewish and Semitic culture. The firstborn son would get the honor of having a double portion of the family's inheritance. And secondly, they would have the privilege as when the patriarch, the father, passed away, they would be the next family leader. But because of his hunger, he despises that and says, just like his, his uh, father, uh, you know, uh, Isaac, who, who loved food, who loved, who loved the venison and, and the, the meat, the things that he would hunt for, he, he loved food. Uh, Esau says, I'll, you can have it. What do I care about tradition? What do I care about, you know, all the custom? And so I just want food. And so they agreed. And Jacob wrestled from his brother the right of being the eldest, the, the privileges of the birthright. Uh, later on in chapter 27, we read that uh, as Isaac was getting old, years are passing and catching up with him, his eyes were weak so that he could no longer see. And he called for Esau, his older son, Genesis 27 and verse 1. Here's another cultural norm of the day. The patriarch would pass on a blessing to his children, and in particular to the eldest son, there would be a special blessing. Now, Rachel, mama, <clears throat> God bless all the mamas here today. Rachel knew this day was coming. When we read the scheme and the plan or the plot that she had laid out for her favorite son, Jacob, this is not something she just dreamed up in a moment's time. She knew that sooner or later, knowing the culture, knowing the customs, that aging Isaac was going to bless his eldest son. And she had a plot in mind to steal that blessing for her favorite son, Jacob, and not for Esau. She shares this plot with Jacob, and for a moment, to his credit, he says, what if my father touches me? I, I'm not a hairy man. Uh, he's he's going to know that I'm tricking him, and I'll bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. For a moment, he has a bit of conscience, but his mother persists, and he goes along with the plot. If you don't know the rest of the story, this whole story is amazing. The latter half of Genesis, uh, it, it's, a, it's soap opera material. It's something for a miniseries. I encourage you to read this more at length uh, as you can this coming week. What an interesting story. He goes along with the plot. Uh, after he hesitates, he says, okay, I'll do it. The result is aging Isaac blesses, gives the elder son's blessing to the younger son, Jacob. When Esau comes home with venison, he's devastated, and he eventually becomes angry to the point that he wants to kill his brother. We read in chapter 27, verse 36, Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? He has deceived me these two times. He took my birthright, and now he has taken my blessing. Well, obviously, Jacob has to flee Esau for his life. Uh, we read that Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing of his father uh, that had been given to him. He said to himself, These day, the days of mourning for my father are drawing near. Then, after that, I will kill my brother Jacob. Well, in his flight... Jacob has a dream as he is heading toward Pandanaram, the home area of his mother's family. In that dream, God's promise comes to Jacob. This is the first spiritual encounter, genuine spiritual encounter that we read of that Jacob has with God. And here's what God says to Jacob in the dream. Genesis 27, starting at verse 13. I am the Lord the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac, I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go and I will never leave you until I have done what I have promised. 
What is Jacob's response? Well, it's interesting. It's almost as interesting to note what Jacob doesn't say as much as what God doesn't say. It's very telling. He says uh, without any humility, without any contrition, without any repentance or remorse for how he's treated his brother and what he's done in his relationship with his brother, Jacob makes a vow and he says, if God will be with me. It's conditional. How many of us, if God spoke some promise, uh, some assurance, uh, some, some guaranteed blessing, our response is going to be, well, if God is faithful, if it's convenient, if it fits my plan. Hmm? Jacob says, if God will be with me and if he will watch over me on this journey that I am taking and if he will give me food to eat and clothes to wear. And I'm just adding the ifs there because it, it's the first thing he says, if. So that I can return safely to my father's house, then, the, then <laughs> if, 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 then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. It is apparent that Jacob had a knowledge of God, the Lord Jehovah, the God of his fathers, but that he had a very minimal personal relationship or commitment to God. He had been busy manipulating and conniving his way through life, getting things done his way, counting on himself, not trusting anyone. In his book, Daring to Draw Near, the author John White makes this observation concerning Jacob. We have no way of assessing Jacob's chain of reasoning. It may never have occurred to him that to doubt the integrity of the Most High God was sinful. What is clear is that he was adopting a wait-and-see attitude to the promises that God made. And from his subsequent actions, it was plain that he would help these promises <laughs> along by every device and tactic and strategy that he had learned and grown up with in his life. White says there is an activity that springs from faith and then there is another activity that arises from a lack of it. In Jacob's case we would know which we are dealing with. Obviously Jacob himself makes no bones about his lack of faith. If, 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 then. This characterizes his response to God. Well from that moment uh, Jacob's struggles continue. We read that uh, he gets to Pandanaram, one of the first people that he meets uh, after his encounter in Bethel, uh, is one of his wives-to-be. And I do want to underscore that he goes to this country and to this uh, clan of his mothers at his mother's instruction, okay? More important to God was the breaking process that God was sending Jacob into. For it wasn't just uh, his wife but it was his father-in-law that Jacob is introduced to. Oswald Sanders says this uh, about <laughs> the father-in-law. It is instructive to note the disciplines to which God subjected Jacob in order to achieve his purpose, <laughs> that is, of humbling him and developing trust in him. He put him with a man more mean, more grasping, more crooked than himself. All these years Jacob spent swindling and being swindled, by his uncle. There almost 20 years he would endure this. The supplanter was being supplanted and the cheat cheated. But it was his, this grueling discipline which ultimately led to his transformation of heart and character. Well, there certainly had to be some times of joy for Jacob amidst all of the stress and the strife of being married to Rachel and Leah and seemingly at their demand, giving, <laughs> uh, conceiving children between them and their handmaidens. Dave, I don't know about you, but I am happy with the one wife my, my gracious God has given me. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've counted it a pleasure uh, to, to be uh, blessed by her and to bless her 
uh, and to strive toward a happy home. I could not imagine four women. I, Ron, I, I don't even want to go there. I, but God bless Jacob. So there had to be some joy in his life uh, somewhere. Well, he prospered. His flocks increased. Uh, the 14 years of service for both Rachel and Leah ended. And Laban asked Jacob to stay on. He knows that uh, Jacob is blessed of God, even though Jacob <laughs> kind of emulates his uncle's character, behavior, and traits. Jacob's flocks continue to increase, and Laban's attitude toward Jacob begins to sour. His father-in-law is not as happy and as thrilled as the additional years pass by. And God then speaks to Jacob. In Genesis 31, verse 3, the Lord God said to Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. Jacob attempted to sneak away from Laban, but unsuccessfully. So God warned Laban as he caught up to him, Don't you uh, say anything. Be careful what you say. Uh, don't say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Bless him, bless your children, your grandchildren, but don't hinder him. God warned Laban of God's favor on Jacob. Well, the next hurdle, getting away from father-in-law and family, that clan was, was one obstacle. The next challenge for Jacob is going to be facing his brother, whom he has offended now some 20 years prior. Now he plots to defuse his older brother. And of all of his possessions, of all of his herds, of his family, he groups them all and puts them in, in kind of like waves and sends them ahead of him. We read this in Genesis 32. That night Jacob got up and he took his two wives and his two maidservants and his 11 sons and he crossed the fort of the Jabbok. And after he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. And he, you can read how he had orchestrated. They were going to approach Esau, all these flocks and herds, and, and these were all going to be gifts to Esau from uh, your humble servant Jacob. He was trying to appease <laughs> and manipulate his offended brother. Everything that Jacob has struggled for all of his life and everything that he's achieved in the past 20 years, uh, really in the past uh, 30 years, is being offered as gifts to his brother and the wrestling match with God ensues. While Jacob is left alone, we read, a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched. And as he wrestled with the man, and then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Worried about what the uh, day was going to bring as the day dawned. Out of nowhere, a man comes and pursues a wrestling match with Jacob. Jacob's tenacity allows him to hold his own for a while, but eventually God dislocates his hip, rendering him helpless, and Jacob's impulse is to cling to his pursuer as it dawns on him who he is wrestling with. John White says, these are words that God had waited for over 40 years to hear from Jacob. They would, he would have preferred that Jacob recognize his helplessness and cast himself on the mercy of God long, long before. He did not wish to reduce him to such extremity, but Jacob left no choice. We read then in verse 27, the man asked him, what is your name? The answer, Jacob, deceiver, heel grabber, schemer, conniver. The man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. And so Jacob called the place Peniel, meaning the face of God, saying, it is because I saw the face of God, I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The name heel grabber was replaced with Israel, meaning prince of God, or meaning God strove. Jacob wins 
he wins the wrestling match? <laughs> he clearly lost, but he won in losing. He lost by yielding himself, his will, his ways, his very life to God. Jacob realized for the first time he's got to trust God and not himself. The significance of him clinging and holding on to this <laughs> uh, wrestling opponent. Uh, Jacob was powerless. He was left lame and limp. In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 14, we read from the prophets these words, Do not be afraid, O warm Jacob, O little Israel, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord. Sanders makes this observation in his book, What is weaker, what is more worthless than a worm? Yet Jacob the worm, Jacob the worthless, subject of relentless pursuing love of God becomes a prince having power, <laughs> having standing with God and with men. Well, old ways do die hard. It's not an instant conversion of behavior. Uh, if you read further ahead in chapter 33 and 34, there is the Shechem incident uh, with Jacob's disobedience. He does not go back immediately to uh, the land of his father. But after that disaster, he does go to Bethel and then later when God tells him and provides the way through Joseph, he ends up in Egypt. Without argument, <laughs> he is willing when he knows that God is in it. We long for the blessing of God in our lives, don't we? We, we crave to know his, his favor, his forgiveness, his mercy, and his rewards. But too often, while we desire that, we live out not faith or trust in him, but in our own confidence and in our confidence in ourselves and in our own ability to obtain these blessings and favors. We end up with frustration, with disappointment, and oftentimes unnecessary heartache that we bring on ourselves. I wonder today, are you running from God? He's still pursuing. Are you still running? Are you running from his will? Maybe not from God completely, but in some area, some facet of your life, uh, there are some things you're holding on to, some things that uh, maybe they're secret sins or secret issues that no one else knows of but you and God, but you're, you're holding on, guarding those things, craving those things. And a complete surrender of your life to him and to his ways, you're struggling. <laughs> you're struggling. You're in a wrestling match with God over surrendering those issues. Do you want God's blessing, his favor, but you want it your way instead of his? Are you finding the frustration and the heartache as a result of your trying to do it, God's will, your way? Possibly you know someone today, again, whether you are here, whether you are at home, that the Jacob syndrome, doing it their way, uh, knowing about God, uh, God's good, and if I need him, you know, I'll, I'll call on him, but I'm going to live life my way. I'm going to do it my way. And are you praying for them? I believe that the hound of heaven still follows, follows after us and them. As Dalton comes to lead us in a, a closing course, I want to pray for our online uh, congregation this morning and challenge you as well as us here in the sanctuary today. As we wait upon the Lord, how is it that we are resisting God's relentless love for us? How is it that we <laughs> are not completely surrendering the whole of our lives, our will, to his way? How is it that we are expecting, anticipating the blessing of God and the favor of God, but not willing to follow the ways of God in our lives? You see, we are more like Jacob than we may anticipate or understand. And God would have us <laughs> surrender in a wrestling match, cling to him. Don't let him have to dislocate a hip. <laughs>
Don't let him have to let us reap the consequences of our own decisions and choices. Let us willingly say, God, I surrender to you. Father, I pray for our, our congregation and our friends who are joining us online this, this morning. I pray, God, that even in their home, wherever they may be watching the service, possibly even later today as they view this, that, God, you will help them to be honest with themselves and with you, even as I pray this for us here in the sanctuary this morning, that we would yield ourselves to the persevering love of God and surrender everything completely and totally to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Then we will know peace. Then we will know joy. Jacob finally found a contentment when he realized that he could trust God and not have to work everything out his way in his power. Father, I thank you for this opportunity for us together now to wait upon your spirit as you speak into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.